Thank you, Brother Stoffman. It is of a lady who sat in a wheelchair. With I never had seen anything like it quite. Looked like elephantitis. Great, huge limbs, and they were all raw and in a very bad shape. And I remember before the service had ended that the bad place on the lady's limbs had become normal and pink again like a, a baby. I wonder if the lady would be in the meeting by chance or if she's still alive on the earth. How many remembers the woman sitting in a wheelchair, blankets around her? I just remembered it was way back towards the, this end of the building. <clears throat> Now, tomorrow afternoon, as I am told, that my good friend, Brother Robert Toms of South Africa, will be bringing the afternoon's uh, message tomorrow. It would do you good to hear Brother Toms and his heart-thrilling message of, uh, of Christ, that how he has been brought into the gospel as a drunken sailor of the South African army, and how the Lord saved him and has made him a minister of the gospel and he's got a native work on his heart, doing great work over there among the native people of South Africa. And now we're expecting the Lord to give us a great meeting. Tomorrow is a holiday, as I understand, a holiday here in Canada. And we perhaps won't be working, so try to get out to the meetings. <clears throat> now tonight, pardon me, I will not speak but just a little while tonight because we're fixing to run a prayer line to pray for the sick. Therefore, since I have left, I've been in prayer. And I, most time, in going into these meetings, when you've got long meetings, I do not eat or anything, just fast and pray and wait on the Lord. It's an anointing, an angel of the Lord. And it's not the anointing of preaching because it works under a different gift. There's many different gifts that God has to his church. But they're all for the perfecting of the church to bring together in unity the great body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the powers that was in Christ has been given to his church. All that God was, he poured into Christ. And Christ was God manifested on earth. And all that Christ was, he poured into his church. And all the powers that God had rested in Christ, and the fullness of Christ rests in his church. So what a people this should be. But the only thing that I found in my travel, I found two different types of people. One of them is the fundamentalist. The other is the Pentecostal. And the fundamentalist positionally knows their place in Christ by election. But they don't have too much faith. The Pentecostal has a lot of faith, but don't know their position. So it's just like a man that had a lot of money in the bank and couldn't write a check, and the other one could write a check and didn't have no money in the bank. If we could only get those together, either Pentecostal faith with fundamental doctrine, or fundamental doctrine with Pentecostal faith, it will work. So if the church only knew its position... And the greatest hindrance in the church is fear. They're afraid that it just won't work. Well, it, it just won't for you <laughs> that way. It just is not, will not work that way. It must be absolutely believers. Not make believers, but believers from your heart. Now, so that we won't keep you long each night, but we like to read a portion of God's Word. Now, any man that's able to move his hands can move his hands and open the Word like that. But it takes the Holy Spirit to really open the Word. No man in heaven was worthy. No man in the earth or beneath the earth. And John wept until he seen a lamb that had been slain since the foundation of the world. Come and take the book out of the right hand of him that set up on the throne, and open the book and loose the seals thereof. I'm not a theologian. I do not know the book real well, but I know the author real well. So I, I know him because he's my Savior. He forgives me of my sins, and I, I love him with all my heart. And before we 
try to open his word, let us speak to him just a moment in prayer. Most gracious Father, it is indeed a great pleasure that thou hast given to us to come to thee by the way of prayer. And we present ourselves to thee now as unworthy creatures, creatures of time, speaking to the one who is eternal. But the reason that we come, we have been bid to come by the Lord Jesus, thy beloved Son, who said unto us, Ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. And we so graciously embrace that invitation, for we are needy people. Oh, our needs are so many. And we pray, Father, that you will meet every need that we have need of tonight. Give unto us thy presence, and may the power of the Lord be present to heal the sick, as it was once quoted in the Scriptures. And we pray that you will forgive us of our sins. And you will bring home the backslider that's away from God and save the sinner. Heal the sick. Give comfort to those who are weary. And when we leave this building tonight, may we say like those who were coming from Emmaus one night, on that first beautiful Easter morning, when the flowers were blooming, Two broken-hearted, disappointed disciples walked along the road towards Emmaus. Theopius and his friend. And while in their journey, there came one and talked to them. All day while talking, they did not recognize just who it was. But when the evening shadows began to fall... And he was asked to come in and abide with them. Once inside the house, the doors closed. He did something just like he did before his crucifixion. It was a proof of his resurrection. No other man in the world could do it like he did. And those disciples knew that it was him. And quickly they rushed back and said, Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the way? And after these hundreds of years has passed, may we go from this building tonight with the same expression, Did not our hearts burn within us as he spoke to us along the service? Grant it, Father. Thou hast promised that you would give it to us if we would ask it. So we asked it with faith believing in the name of thy beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Just by the way of introducing the meeting tonight, tomorrow night, the Lord willing, we will take a regular evangelistic subject. But tonight, introducing... The campaign to you, I have chosen to read from St. John, the twelfth chapter and the twentieth verse. And I pray that God will bless the reading of his word. And we will also include the twenty-first verse. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethesda of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. And I want to take my text from Hebrews 13, 8, my subject from the last five words of the preceding reading. Sirs, we would see Jesus. And the Hebrews 13, 8 reads like this. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
Now I suppose that every person in the world that ever heard of the Lord Jesus would have this same desire that these Greeks had when they come up to the worship. For there is no one that's ever heard of that precious name but what longs to see him. And their hearts, yet they were scholars. The Greeks had wisdom. And they were scholars in their fields. They didn't desire his wisdom. And they didn't desire any art that he had. But their question was and their request that they wanted to see him. They had heard of him. And they wanted to see him. And tonight, if I would say to this audience of people, would you love to see him? Every person in here, if it was asked, would put up their hand. I would love to see him. How many would, just for the way of, of vindication, would love to see him? As far as I could see, it was a hundred percent. Everyone wants to see him. Well, I wonder then, if the Bible declares that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, why is it we can't see him? For if the scriptures being right that he has risen from the dead, and the Bible said he's the same, he's got to be the same in principle, the same in power, the same in attitude, the same in motive. He's just got to be the same Jesus. Now here's where the showdown comes. When you're talking out of, in the way from the civilized world or into the world of different religions of Mohammed and Buddha and so forth, they only can claim that they have a book the Mohammed speaking, called the Koran. A good friend of mine some time ago, his name is Dr. Reedhead, Marsh Reedhead. Many of you know him. He's the president of the great Sudan missions, the greatest fundamental mission in the world. And then Mohammed had been brought over to this country and educated I believe it was for electronics. But on his road back after his education in this great school, Dr. Reedhead said to him, Son, when you go back to your homeland, why don't you take with you the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ, and renounce that old dead prophet Mohammed that you serve? And the Mohammed scooted his feet on the ground a few times and looked up to Mr. Reedhead. And he said, Mr. Reedhead, kind sir, what could your Jesus do for me any more than what my prophet can do? He said they both wrote books. And they both promised life after death. And said, you believe your book called the Bible. I believe my book called Koran. He said, therefore, what could your Jesus do any more for me, what more could he do, rather, than what Mohammed could do? And Mr. Reedhead said, well, your Mohammed is dead and in the grave. Perhaps many men here has been to it the same as I. They have a white horse saddled and at his grave and has been there changing guards every few hours for the past 2,000 years. Expecting Mohammed to rise someday, jump on his horse, and ride and conquer the world. But said, Mohammed is dead and in the grave. But Jesus has raised from the dead, and he lives. And the Mohammed said to Mr. Reed, he said, Did he? I would like to see you prove it to me that he's raised from the dead. Well, he said, I know that he's raised from the dead. He said, because he's in my heart right now. 
and I have joy and peace and satisfaction. Therefore, he said, I know that he has raised from the dead. And the Mohammed looked the Christian in the face and said, Now, just a moment, Mr. Reedhead. The Mohammed religion can produce just as much psychology as Christianity can. We're just as happy, can shout just as loud and jump just as high. Believing that Mohammed will come back and ride the world down and conquer the world as you have, believing Jesus will come back. So therefore, you cannot prove any more of your resurrection than I can by my prophet. And he said, furthermore, Mr. Reedhead, he said, your Jesus promised more than our Mohammed did. Your Jesus promised that the things that he did, you would do also. Our Mohammed only promised life after death. Said, we Mohammeds are waiting to see you Christians prove that. And then we'll believe it. He said, what do you mean by promising? Well, he said, it was promised that you would heal the sick. And great signs and wonders would be done. Said, we are waiting to see that done. You've had 2,000 years to prove that he raised from the dead. And only one-third of the world ever heard of it. So we got twice as many in the Mohammed religion as you have in Christianity, that's Catholic and all, and we're growing twice as fast. And that's true. It certainly is true. They're up and at it. We sit around like dumb, driven cattle. I like Longfellow, that great English poet, said, Be not like dumb, driven cattle. Be a hero. That's right. So he said, Mr. Reedhead said, Perhaps, sir, you're referring to Mark 16. That was a scripture I read this afternoon. He said, Yes, that's one of them, but not all of them, of the promises of, of your Jesus. He said, I perceive that you have read the New Testament. He said, I've read the whole Bible of yours through many times. He said, But we under, you understand, sir, we better scholars have learned that Mark 16 from the ninth verse on is not inspired writing, that promise there. That was put in there falsely. And the Mohammed looked at the Christian and said, What kind of a book are you reading? Said, All oh, the Koran's inspired. And if just part of your book is inspired and other parts are not inspired, how will you know which one is inspired? Mr. Reedhead said, I knew right then I had not come in contact with just an overnight boy. That man knew what he was talking about. He said, Brother Branham, I kicked my foot in the sand and changed the subject. And he said, I was called to preach the gospel at seven years old. And he said, when I got my B.A., said, I thought surely I'd find Jesus right there. He wasn't there. He said, when I got my D.D., I thought I would find Jesus there, but he wasn't there. And he said, I perhaps got enough degrees, honorary degrees, to plaster your wall here. He said, but where is Christ in all of it? He says, has the teachers been wrong? And I said, sir, I wouldn't want to say the teachers was wrong. What they told you was all right. But there's some more to it. He said, now, Brother Branham, I've been in the Pentecostal meetings and knowing that I was a Baptist. And he said, I've seen him kick over chairs and tear up the furniture. But I want to ask you something. Is there anything to that Holy Ghost that they talk about? I said, absolutely, it's the truth. He said, then, as a Baptist to a Baptist, I want to ask you. Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. said, what more could Abraham do but believe God? I said, that's true. But God gave him circumcision as a witness and a confirmation he had received his faith. And no matter how much you profess faith until God gives you the Holy Spirit, the confirmation, the seal of God, 
He's never recognized your faith yet. Ephesians 4.30 says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you're sealed and until the day of your redemption. He said, Mr. Branham, I want the Holy Spirit now. And on the floor he fell and broke the glass in the little coffee table as his hand went down there. And Marsh Reedhead has received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and is preaching divine healing in the nation tonight. What is it? It's Jesus. Now, if you wanted to see him and you raised your hand that you wanted to see him, now there could be any kind of a false impersonation come in with a little white robe on and maybe a little spindly man as Jesus was and put some nail scars in his hands and deceive you in that manner. That person will never come until the rapture of the church in that corporal body. For when he comes, every eye shall see him, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess when he comes. But he is here in the person of the Holy Spirit. I am the vine, ye are the branches. Now the vine does not bear fruit, St. John 15. The vine cannot bear fruit. It's the branches that bears fruit as it's energized from the vine. And Christ is our energy. But your lips is His lips when you're energized. Your hands is His hands when you're energized from the vine. Christ is the life vine of His church. And each member is the branch of His church. Now, if we wanted to be sure that we were right, how would we know that He is the same yesterday, today, and forever? How would we know when we've seen Him? Now, if we're talking physically, would, let's just take it physically for a few moments. Would we go to find a man that was real natally dressed? No, sir, he wasn't. Would we find a man... That like some great bishop? No, sir. He did not have much dealings with such people. He would have had it if they would have had him. But if it's the same yesterday, today, and forever, they rejected him then, they'll reject him now. God takes his man, but never his spirit. The spirit of Elijah, Elijah came on Elisha. Several hundred years later, came on John the Baptist and made him act just like Elisha. The devil takes his man, but never his spirit. So the spirit of Antichrist is not communism. It's a religious spirit. Jesus warned us of that in Matthew 24. The two spirits would be so close together that it would deceive the very elect in the last days, if it was possible. Now, notice, what type of person would we find? Someone that used great, eloquent speech? His speech was so common until the Bible said the common people heard him gladly. The Bible was written in such common language to the translators are all turned around today by it. Now, in America... We're supposed to speak English. But if I ever needed an interpreter, it was when I was in London. I could not understand that Cockney speech. I, I just couldn't do it. It sounded like way down in their chest somewhere they were speaking. And to show you the difference, I called from Miami, Florida to New York one night to pray for a sick man. And there was such a difference between the little operator at New York and the one at Miami, the little southern girl, till they had to get a girl in St. Louis to interpret for both. That's in the USA. So the Bible was written in ordinary language, and the translators are trying to get it up in some great high bracket, and therefore they can't get the meaning. God did that purposely. 
He said, I have hid it from the eyes of the wise and prudent and will reveal it to babes such as will learn. God did it purposely. Don't worry. God's great time wheels are moving just perfectly in order. It's not God out of order. It's you and I out of order. It's what does it. Now, if we wanted to look at him and to know, I believe we are told by Jude in the third verse, there's only one chapter, that we should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. As far as I know, that's the only place in the Bible that we are, we are asked to contend. But that was to contend for not a faith, but the faith that was once delivered to the saints. If I'd asked the Methodist here, they'd say, that's what we're contending for. I'd ask the Baptist, they'd say, that's what we're contending for. If I'd ask the Pentecostal, that's what we're contending for. And if I'd ask the Nazarenes, that's what we're contending for. If I'd ask the Catholics, they'd say, that's what we're contending for. Well, I believe that's true to your understanding. But there's only one way to be positive, and that's to go back in the Bible and see what kind of a faith they had, and then earnestly contend for that. That is, laying the Baptist, the Presbyterian, the Pentecostal, and all to one side, going right back into God's Word and seeing what it says about it. Now, my subject, my thought, rather, tonight, and the campaign thought is this, that Jesus Christ is not dead. Blessed be His name, He is alive forevermore. And the only mediator between God and man, Christ Jesus, and He lives today. He is alive, and He's omnipresent, omnipotent, omnipotent, He's the infant, immortal Son of the living God. Amen. And He never changes and never will. Amen. Notice, if that cannot be proved, then it's just common theology. It's just common everyday talking. But if it is proved, then it's right and it's worth living and dying for. If it is the truth. Let us turn back in the pages of time. And let's take a precious book tonight. And you just place it in your mind if you want to follow me. All right. If you do not, then read it when you go home or tomorrow in the quietness of your room. Let's go to the blessed book of St. John and take the first chapter. We find out that after the birth of Jesus and after he was baptized by the Holy Spirit, and he received the Spirit without measure. We receive the Spirit by measure. But he received it without measure. The fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelt in Christ. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. We are just gifts of God to his church. Therefore, the Spirit that was in Jesus was like all the water in the world. And the gifts of the Spirit from Jesus is like a spoonful of that same water. But the chemicals that's in the entire ocean is in a spoonful of water. It's the same chemical, just not as much of it. We have it by measure. He had it without measure. Now notice, when he started his earthly ministry, the first thing taking place, he began to preach the gospel to the poor. And the poor received him. And immediately he began praying for the sick. Great signs and wonders began to happen. It stirred the curiosity of the people. Now we'll take one of his first miracles. The strange thing was when Simon Peter came to him. Now, he had never seen him in his life. 
but he knew who he was. And he called him by name and told him who his daddy was. Thou art Simon, the son of Jonas. But from hereafter you shall be called Peter. Strange. It startled the fishermen. And then there was a man that we're speaking of tonight by the name of Philip. And he got saved by believing on the Lord Jesus. And he was so anxious to tell everybody about it. He had a good friend by the name of Nathaniel. And so he goes around the mountain from where Jesus was preaching here at Galilee and finds Nathaniel under a tree praying. Perhaps, I think, they came about 30 miles around the mountain. The journey would have been. And so the next day, while Jesus is continuing in his prayer line, now let's watch and see what he was yesterday. If we can find what he was yesterday, he's got to be the same today if he is the same. Now just don't let that pass over you. Let it settle. Just lay aside our differences now. If he is the same today that he was yesterday, then he has to do the same that he did yesterday. And after Philip's conversion, and he found Nathaniel under a tree praying, he said, Come see who we have found. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And you know, this Nathaniel was an orthodox believer. I can just see him raise up and brush off his robe and said, Now could there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? See, he belonged to the high church. And he wanted to know if any good thing can come from Nazareth. And I think Philip gave him the best answer that any man could give him. said, Come and see. Don't set off and criticize. Come see for yourself. And on the road around, as they talked, and they came up to where Jesus was the next day, and when those lovely eyes seen Philip coming up with Nathaniel, Jesus turned and looked to Nathaniel, and he said, Behold an Israelite in whom is no guile. And it astonished the little orthodox. And he said, Rabbi, when did you know me? Well, this is the first time we've ever met. I have never seen you in my life. Neither have you seen me. And how would you know that I was a just and honest man, a believer? Now, all men dressed just alike in them days. Wore beards and Garments just alike. He could have been a Greek or something else. But he said he's an Israelite in whom is no guile. It astonished him, that miracle. And he said, how did you know me? Oh, don't let this pass you. Jesus said, yesterday, while you were under the tree, I saw you. Thirty miles around the mountain. But I saw you when you were under the tree. That little Jew raised up and he said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, because I told you this, you believe, you'll see greater things than this. Now, that was the Jewish expression. I mean the believing Jew. Philip expressed the thoughts of the real, true, believing Jew. But what did the church group do? They said, this man is Beelzebub, mental telepathy, fortune teller. Watch what Jesus said to them. He said, you call me Beelzebub, I'll forgive you. But when the Holy Ghost has come to do the same thing, one word against it will be never forgiven in this world or the world to come. 
bear that in mind. Jesus said when the Holy Ghost came and done the same thing that he did, there would never be forgiveness of speaking against it. That's his word. Who would dispute it? Because they call the Spirit of God in him, working those miracles, an unclean spirit, like a fortune teller or some medium or something. Beelzebub. Now we find him on his road going up down to Jericho in the fourth chapter of St. John. And on his road down to Jericho, he had need to go by Samaria. I wonder why. We'll get to it in a few moments. And when it's about noontime, he sent his disciples away in the city to buy victuals. And in the old world, they have wells that they draw their water from. And all the women come out early in the morning with the pitchers, and I'd call them pitchers. They got like great big handles on them, and they got hooks that goes on this, and a window goes down into the well, and they get the water and bring it back up on a window. And the ladies all stand out there and talk just as ladies can do, you know. And they get all, and sometimes they can put a pitcher of water on their head and one on each hip, walk right down the street, talking, carrying a conversation, and never spill a drop. How they do it, I don't know. But I've watched them. This was up in the day. It must have been around noon. And there was a lady in the city, as we believe to be a a woman of ill fame, prostitute. And she came out to the well about noon to get water. It's commonly believed that she couldn't come out with the, with the decent women of the city. And so it's about noon she came out to get water. And as she let the, the kettle down to get the water or the pitcher, when she let it down, she looked sitting over against the wall, which is a little panoramic, and vines usually grow over it, grapes and so forth. And she looked sitting there, and there sat a Jew. A man was only in his 30s, but according to the Scripture, he looked to be about 50. You know, they said, you're not yet 50 years old, and say, you saw Abraham, now we know you got a devil. He said, before Abraham was, I am. But he looked to be about 50 years old, sitting, leaning back against the wall. And as the woman started to put her kittle down to get the water, he said, Woman, bring me a drink. She turned quickly because there was a law of segregation. Just like in the states in the south now, between the white and colored. A law of segregation. She said, You Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And it's not customary. It's not a custom for a Jew to have any dealings with a Samaritan. And he said, but if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. Why, she said, the well's deep and you have nothing to draw with. That was Jesus yesterday. That wasn't a Jew now, this is a Samaritan. She said, you have nothing to draw with. The conversation went on at length about Jacob digging the well about worshiping in Jerusalem or in the mountain. And finally, Jesus, contacting her spirit, said, go get your husband and come here. She said, I don't have any husband. He said, that's right. You've got five, and the one you're now living with is not your husband. And she said, sir, listen to this Samaritan now. What did the Jew say when that was performed on him? You're the son of God. That was the sign of the Messiah. Now look what the Samaritan said. She said, Sir, we know that when the Messiah cometh, he'll do this, tell us these things. But who are you? You must be a prophet. He said, I am he, the Messiah. And she ran into the city and told those Samaritan people, Come see a man who told me the things I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? If that was the sign of the Messiah then, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, it's got to be the sign of Messiah tonight. That's what the Jews thought. That's what the Samaritans thought. What do you Gentiles think about it? 
You're a Western people. This is your day. That was their day. This is your day. Christ is obligated to be the same to you as he was to them. Or there's a respect of person in him. He's obligated to do it. Let's take him one more scripture. There were some people crowding him. He saw he must go visit Jairus' house and heal his little girl. And there was a woman with a blood issue. And she said within her heart, If I can only touch that man's garments, I'll be made well. And she pressed through the crowd until she touched his garment. Physically, he did not feel it. The Palestinian garment is a loose garment. And they have an underneath garment that goes down about the knees to keep the dust off. As they walk, the robe picks up the dust and comes up. And that's the reason they've washed their feet. They're dusty. And along the roads where the horses is and animals, they have an awful smell of the dust. So they have to wash it off before they're a fit or, or feel welcome to come into a house of a guest. They wash their feet. And the lowest paid man in the whole group is the flunky that washes the feet. And how Jesus become a foot wash flunky. And then we think we're somebody. Because we can ride an automobile and get $60 a week wages, and then we think we're somebody. And we just have to go about and have to have the very best or we won't go. How about the prophets who wandered about in sheepskin and goatskin and deserts and destitute and starved? The Bible said in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, whom the world is not worthy of such people. Look what a requirement Christianity gives today. Nice plush seat, a smart, eloquent speaker, not over 15 minutes. Oh, my. Preachers have to be promised so much and they won't go to a certain place. They won't take pastoral unless they give them so much money. A Cadillac each year and so forth. It's a disgrace. Right. We've got no right to require such as that. Uh, you may think I'm an awful hard preacher, but my brother, truth is truth. We must face it. This little woman touched his garment and she ran back, stood in the audience, and Jesus stopped and said, Who touched me? While Peter rebuked him, said, The whole crowd's are touching you. Why do you say, who touched me? He said, but I perceive that I've gotten weak. Virtue, strength has gone from me. Somebody touched me. That was Jesus yesterday. The Bible said today that he's a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He looked around. Every one of them denied it. She denied it. All denied it. But he was endued with power. The Holy Spirit. He watched over that audience until he found the one that touched him. And he said, Thy faith has saved thee from that blood issue. That was Jesus yesterday. If he's the same today, he has to be the same. He'll do the same. He'll act the same. And if his church has got his spirit, they'll be like Christ. Amen. If I told you I had the spirit of some outlaw in me like John Dillinger, you'd expect me to have big guns and be dangerous to be around me if his spirit was in me. If I told you I had the spirit of some famous artist, you'd expect me to be able to catch the waves of the, of the sunset and so forth and paint like that artist. If his spirit is in me. Oh, I hope this goes home. But if the Christian church has got the Spirit of Christ, they'll do the works of Christ. Christ said so. If the Spirit is in the church, what faith are you to contend for? we just Christians by profession. We might be Christians by cold formal profession. We might be Christians by radical, enthusiastic, hysterical faith. But a real Christian... The Spirit of Christ produces the Bible again, for it's His Spirit. Now, one more scripture, St. John 5. 
He went out into a place of Bethesda, a place where hundreds and hundreds of people, a great multitude. If I understand right, it takes 2,000 to make one a multitude. There was in that blind, blind lame, halt and withered. Look what a mess that was. Historians tell us that they stabbed one another trying to get in the water first. For an angel come with the water poured out here on these five porches at these twelve spouts. The water's come out, and when the water's come back this way, an angel was standing there troubling the water. The first one stepping in with faith, testing their faith against the water, got healed of whatsoever disease they had. Thousands laid waiting. And after the healing of this woman, there comes Jesus down to here with all these multitudes of people. Passed right by every one of them and went and found a man laying on a pallet. I don't know where you Canadians know what a pallet is or not. How many know what a pallet is? Well, it's, most of you do. I was raised on one. <laughs> Just a quilt and a pillow laying at the door. That's a little pallet. And this man was laying on a little pallet as to say. And when Jesus knew he was there, watch the scripture, closely now as they close. Jesus knew he was there and knew he had been sick for 38 years. Now, he wasn't crippled, neither was he lame or halt. He wasn't blind. But let's say he had some kind of a disease like TB, prostate trouble. It was retired. It wasn't going to kill him. He had had it 38 years. Jesus knew all about it. And he walked over to him and said, Will thou be made whole? That's Jesus yesterday. Watch him. And he said, I have no one to put me in the water. He said, Take up your bed and go to your house. He never questioned. He just picked up his bed, put it on his shoulder, went on his road. St. John 5. Now let's read the 19th verse. He was being questioned by the Jews. You think he'd be questioned tonight in Edmonton if he is here? How did he pass by thousands of people, lame, blind, halt, and withered, and heal one man like that and walk away and leave the rest of them laying there? Now listen at him. Watch his scripture now. St. John 5, 19. Don't fail to read it. Jesus answered this. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself. But what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. How many ever read that in the Bible? Let's show you your Bible readers. Then Jesus Christ never performed one miracle or did one thing until first God the Father showed him what to do by vision, according to his own word. Verily, verily, that's absolutely, absolutely, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself. But what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. Now read the prophets, read the Christ, and find out if any man ever did anything by his own will or his own thoughts. He always did it according to what God showed him to do. No man can take glory, not even to the Son of Man. The glory goes to God alone. Now, that was Jesus yesterday. If he's the same, he's got to be the same today. Now notice this, and close now. We see what he did yesterday. Now let's take his words just before he died. And then rose. He said, a little while, and the world will see me no more. All that's ever read that scripture say, Amen. A little while, and the world, that's word there's cosmos, which means the world order, the people of the world. The world will see me no more. Yet ye shall see me, that's the church, for I, personal pronoun, will be with you to the end of the world. A little while, and the world won't see me no more. That's a physical being. Yet the church will see me, for I'll be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. Listen to this promise. And the things that I do shall you do also, and more than this shall you do. I know the King James gives greater, but the right translation is more. No one could do anything greater than he did. He, he raised the dead, he healed the sick, he stopped nature. He did everything. No man could do greater, but they could do more of it because he would be in the church universal. 
More than this shall you do, for I go to my Father. He ascended on high. Let captive, captive give gifts to man. Now, if Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, if he doesn't act the same, do the same, in every principle, then he is not the same. If he does it, then he is the same. And if he doesn't do it, then his word's no good. If he does do it, he's the infallible God of heaven. And he deserves our love and our attention if he does do it. And to me, this is either the Word of God or it is not the Word of God. Amen. And don't you ever be guilty of being ashamed of the gospel to place your soul on any phase of that book. God's obligated to his Word. Certainly he is. But you can't do it wishy-washing around. You've got to come out and be exactly what you say you are. Now, if Jesus Christ, God's Son, will come into this audience tonight, that's going to be hard. For it's your first night. And Jesus, no matter if He stood here wearing this suit that He gave me, he could not heal you tonight. Anybody know that? It's already a past tense. He's already did it. If he stood here with this suit on, you'd come to him and say, Lord Jesus, won't you heal me? He'd say, my child, I did that 1,900 years ago when I paid the price for your sickness. Will you forgive me, Lord, of my sins? I did it, child, 1,900 years ago. Do you wish to accept it tonight? It's a finished work. But you've got to accept it as your own personal property. It's a love gift that God has given you. But He would still be the same in His power to manifest Himself, God working through Him. He works through His church just like He did through His Son. And if He will do that and do the same things that He did when He walked the shores of Galilee, how many in your say by an uplifted hand it will increase my faith. It will give me better hopes. I believe it will make me a more of a staunch Christian. And I'll try by the grace of God to live a better life. I'll try to have more faith, testify, be a better member of my church if Jesus will appear here tonight and do that. Let's see your hands all over the audience. The Lord bless you. Now you see what a challenge it is. Does anyone want to come here and take the place? You're welcome. But it's a thing that's... It's God's Word. How the world can't see that. How you've just been intellectually blinded to the real spirit of life. Christ will keep His Word. And now, when Jesus went to a group of people one time who said, Now, we heard He did this over in another city. Let me see Him do it here. The Bible said many mighty works he could not do. Is that right? Because of their unbelief. No matter how great the gift of God is, it will never manifest till there's somebody to do it, like the woman touching his garment. We will pray. And I believe that I've always found, don't say this because I'm standing here, I can just go ahead and bypass it. But I've always found one thing about Canadian people. As a majority, when they promise you something... They'll stick with it. See? They're called Royal Canadian. And that's right. They usually stick to their word. And I believe when you raise your hand to Christ, that if he would manifest himself in the same powers, the same way he did in the days gone by, it would increase your faith as a Christian to believe him. I trust that sinners will be saved. And what more? And God will heal the sick. Now, if it comes to say, Brother Branham, would you heal my baby? Would you do this? I wish I could. But it doesn't lay in my power to do that. Neither does it lay in any other man's power. That's with God alone. But what's the meetings to do? Have people come up here for I lay hands on them? That's not even necessary. It's for you not to touch me or I touch you. It's for you to touch him. Right where you are, just look to him and say, Lord, 
You're the high priest of my confession. You're the high priest that can be touched by the feeling of my infirmities. I'm sick tonight, Lord Jesus. I now confess my faith and believe that you healed me 1,900 years ago, and I now believe it and accept it. Watch what he'll do. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He cannot fail. Now, tonight, I don't know just what this arena seats, but there's, I'm going to say, at least a thousand people in the building. All right? Now, this, in a few minutes, God, if He doesn't make His Word good, then I'm found a false prophet. But if He makes His Word good, then I've been found to tell the truth. Now, I've spoken for him. It's his time to speak whether I've spoke rightly or not. Now, you can see what a predicament we place ourselves. And we ask you to be reverent as you can be for the next few minutes. And we'll pray for the sick. And may the Lord bless you, each one. Now, we're, we give out some prayer cards. What are the prayer cards for? I'll, I'll show you. How many in here is sick and wants God to heal them? Raise up your hands. Everybody in the building, anywhere you are, no matter balconies, wherever you are, raise your hands. There's got sickness. And want. Now, who's going to be first? There you are. That's what prayer cards are for. See? It's just a little card with a number on it. You just take the number, and as you're called, come to the platform by your number. And then you that does not have a prayer card tonight, and you want God to heal you, raise up your hand. Does not have a prayer card, everywhere in the building, no matter where you are. See, it's just everywhere. You don't have to have a prayer card. The prayer card has nothing to do with it, just to, uh, to give you a lot and a number to stand here by. Sometimes we call from one place and another, no matter where it's at, we just call a few people up here so that the presence of God can be known in the audience. And then when the people realize that Christ is here... That he's not dead, but raised from the dead, and he's the same in principle and power. Thousands reach up and accept him. That's when the healing takes place. Then it isn't Brother Branham. Neither is it any other man. It's your faith in Jesus Christ that does it. Your own prayer, your own faith. That's the only thing that will do any good anyhow, is your prayer and your faith in God. Let us pray. Blessed Father, in a little broke up, chopped up message of this type, but trying to place before this loyal people that you are the same, that you're not dead, why, you're very much alive and has been alive since the very dawn of time. You was back in the bosoms of God before there was even a world or a light. You were still Christ. And when all the world is no more and the seas have wept theirself into deserts, you'll still be Christ forevermore. When there's no more factories, no more man, no more churches, no more organizations, no more nothing, you are left on this earth, you'll still be Christ. And to you the aeons of time to come, you'll still be Christ. Oh, for the sake of these, Lord, some of them are, are a little feeble, maybe, in their faith. They're just a little wobbling along, going to church, seeing the great pressure of the Spirit today, knowing that we're living in the closing time, and we're aware that there's something going on. Yonder in Russia, perhaps, a bomb is already centered for the middle of this city. And also in the American around the world. But we also have bombs centered from the middle of their city. It's just who pulls the trigger, presses the button first. There could be a total annihilation in five minutes. Oh God, no wonder the world has become neurotic. But you said when these things begin to come to pass, raise up your head. Your redemption's drawing nigh. No, give us voice to cry out in the darkness for the sake of lost souls. Grant it, Lord. Now speak tonight, Lord, and let the people know that you are still alive. It'll increase the faith of the believers and make believers out of unbelievers and heal the sick so that they can glorify thee. 
I submit and commit this audience and myself into thy hands, that thou might work through their gift of faith and the gift that thou hast given to thy servant for the manifestation of God's presence. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Leo, who get, uh, Billy or you give up? Billy? Very hard. D? One to a hundred? <clears throat> Pardon me, I just seen who gave out the prayer cards and what they gave. They gave out prayer cards E, uh, B, D, D, one to a hundred. Now, we can't bring them all at once. We'll just start and bring a few at a time. Now, look at, take out your card, and you having a card, look over to your neighbor because someone maybe can't get up. They're paralyzed. Maybe some's deaf and can't hear. So we'll have to, we want to get them in the line when their numbers are called. Now, let's see who has D, prayer card D number one. It's a little card with my picture on it. Turn it over, and it's got a D and a number one. Who has that card? Raise up your hand. If you can, raise your hand. All right, the lady here. Would you come right here, lady? Number two, who has that prayer card? Would you raise your hand? If you can walk, sir, come right here. Prayer card number three, would you raise your hand? At the end over there, the man? Come here, sir, if you can. Number four, raise your hand. Prayer card four. Uh, four, prayer card four, would you come here, lady? Prayer card five. Now, don't come till your number is called. Prayer. That I know outside of Mr. Mercer sitting here, my tape boy, Mr. Gold here somewhere, I don't know where he is, Mr. Sothman and a couple of these men behind me. The rest of you are strangers, but God knows all. I suppose in the prayer line that each one of us is strangers. If we are, raise up your hand. If I don't know you, you don't know me, raise up your hand. Up and down the prayer line. Now, Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Is that right? Now, again, how many out there doesn't have prayer cards, and you want Jesus to heal you, and you believe that you can pray to your high priest and touch him, that can be touched, and he'll turn around and do the same thing he did to the woman with the blood issue. How many without prayer cards believe that? Raise your hand. All right. Just believe it. Have faith. Don't be in no hurry. Now, don't be excited. Oh, you say, it's 9 o'clock. No matter what time it is, I'm getting tired. No matter how tired you're getting, wait just a few minutes. Don't criticize. Just wait and say, I, I'm going to see it through. I'm, Lord, help me not to be a critic, but help me to weigh it out with the Bible. Now, I want to ask you, the things that I said about Christ, are they right and in the Bible? How many believe that raise up your hand? And then does the Bible say that he is the same and he promised that he would do the same? Let's see your hand. Was that the sign that the Jew say when he did that sign to the real believing Jew, the spirit-filled Jew? He said, "That's you're the Son of God. He believed it. Nathaniel, we all believe that. No, the Bible said that. The unbelieving Jew, though orthodox and religious as he could be, scholarships after scholarships, he said it's the devil. He's in torment tonight over it. But Nathaniel's immortal. When the Samaritan... When that, that miracle was done, when Jesus told her, found her fault, and told her what her fault was, now she never said he was reading her mind. They know it was the time of season for that Messiah to come, and the Messiah would do that. How many blows that? And she said, we know that when the Messiah cometh, he'll do this. Now that was the sign of the Messiah yesterday. Is that right? Then if he's raised from the dead and the same today, it's still the sign of the Messiah. He said, I'll do nothing till the Father shows me. Now he said, the things I do, so you also. That's just as plain, friends, as I know how to make the Bible. Just as plain. Here it is. Wrote right out here. Here it is. Now the next thing, will it work? Now we've laid it all out here. Will it work? It'll work if you believe it. If you don't believe it, it won't work. Someone said to me one time, said, Brother Bram, I wouldn't believe it anyhow. I said, of course not. It's not for unbelievers. It's for believers. It's just for believers, not for unbelievers. Now, be real reverent. 
And I'm asking God in Christ's name and I take every spirit in here under the control of the Holy Spirit that he might manifest Jesus Christ, God's Son, to this audience to let you know tonight that your faith in him is not in vain. All right, bring the... All right. Now, Reverend, now you can realize where I'm standing. Now I'm going to be found telling the truth or telling a lie. But the reason I don't have any fear, Christ promised it. And I believe with all that is within me that Jesus Christ is in this building right here now. The scientific world knows it. They got the picture of it back there. You can see it tomorrow when they have it. It's in Washington, D.C., the only supernatural being was ever photographed. In Germany, it swept Germany like one big blaze. They take three pictures of it coming and going. 50,000 received Christ. Five nights meeting. The thing is, one thing is say something, the next thing is do something. Now, a man, as far as a man can do, is just preach this word. That's all over. Now it's God's time to talk. And this lady standing here by me, as far as I know, I have never seen the woman in all my life. She's a, a stranger to me. But God does know her. God knows all about her. I don't. He does. If we are strangers to each other, would you just raise up your hand? <clears throat> all right. Now you understand with our right hands up, not swearing because we don't believe in it, but the Bible's laying here and this is the pulpit. We've never met before in our lives. Now, here's a beautiful picture of just now. You may put your hand down now. Here's a beautiful picture of the Bible, of St. John, the fourth chapter. Jesus, a man, met a woman at a well. Here is his church tonight. A man meets a woman, total strangers to each other. A perfect picture. Now, lady, I don't have one idea who you are, where you come from, what you're here for, or nothing about it. You're aware of that, that I do not. But if you're here for finances, domestic troubles, sickness, whatever it is, Christ will give it to you if you'll believe Him. And now I perceive that you are a Christian because the feeling of your spirit, you are a Christian. Because just then something happened that you realize that there's something happened between us right then. That's that light is coming right down over you now. Now, if Christ will reveal to me what that lady is here for, how many will receive him as being the resurrected Son of God? I just want to see the audience of you all over everywhere. Your hand, God sees you, I might not. Just speaking to her like our Lord did to the woman. What's it doing? Finding her spirit. She's a Christian. And the woman is suffering. I see her very upset. She's real nervous. And she's, I see her going in and coming out of somewhere. Keep going in and coming out. It's operations. You've had several operations. I see it. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven operations you've had. Yes. That's right. That's yes. thus right. saith the Lord. How many believe? Now, what more you talk to the woman, more would be said. But I'm trying to hold for the prayer line here. I just reverently, let's speak to her just again so that you'll see. Now, what was said, I don't know. I have no idea. It's another world. But my tape here has it. Now, whatever he told you just a few moments ago, you heard a voice speaking, but it wasn't mine. It might have been my voice, but it wasn't me speaking it. It was him speaking. It's declared to the church... That he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, was that true? That's the truth. If it was, raise your hand so the people would see it was true. Now, I see something. Again, it's some kind of a 
get surgery, something you'd had surgery, but now I see there's some sort of a blood. It's diabetes. <laughs> and I see you trying to get out of a bed or walk across the floor just holding to something. You got arthritis also. <laughs> That's thus saith the Lord. Six years diabetes. Do you believe now? Now, what could I do for the poor woman? Nothing but pray for her. I want you out there to bow your heads with me. This woman is somebody's, somebody's daughter, Christ's child. Let us all pray your prayers to her. What if it was you? Let's all pray together as a united church. Jesus of Nazareth, as your great Holy Spirit, so present now that we can be felt. I lay hands upon this, my sister, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And along with this great ransom church of yours, and we pray a prayer of faith the best of our knowledge, that thou will make our sister to be well of whatsoever is wrong with her. This we ask thee to do in Jesus' name, thy Son. Amen. Now, sister, the Bible says, These signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. You believe that God will make you well now? Or go rejoicing and being happy. Now, be real reverent. Now, we don't know what's going to happen. And you out there, be ready for the next prayer card call. And also, you that's not able, hasn't got a prayer card, be praying. We are strangers to each other, I suppose, my brother. Our first time ever meeting, face to face like this to talk, as far as I know. Oh, you were at the meeting at Edmonton when I was here before. Oh, well, of course, I wouldn't know. <laughs> I never know that. See the thousands of people at a meet. You're here for some cause. I don't know. You might be a critic. You might be a Christian. You might be, I don't know. We're just two men that's met here. Probably born miles apart, years apart, and this is our first time to be this close to one another to meet each other. But you're aware that you're in the presence of something besides a man, your brother. If that's right, raise your hand. Just now it comes settling over you. The man is suffering with something wrong in his stomach. He has a stomach trouble. And it's diagnosed as a tumor. Uh, they, uh, he says a fatty tumor in the stomach. That's thus saith the law. That is true. Now, if i never seen you in my life, there's something here that knows you. Not only that, but you've got something on your heart that you're praying for. That's a woman, your wife. She's here. If God will reveal to me what's wrong with your wife out there, will you believe me to be God's prophet and believe that Jesus Christ and what I preached about him is the truth? Your wife has a gallbladder trouble. And she also has cancer of the stomach. And when you're not from this city, you come from the southeast, about 200 miles away from here, you come here to this city for prayer. That's thus saith the Lord. All right, go lay your hands on her and get well. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. Have faith. Good evening, sir. We are strangers to each other. And as far as I know, the first time we have ever met in this mortal life. But do you believe me to be his servant? All right, lady, with that blue dress sitting there, you've been suffering with heart trouble. 
Little black hat looking at me right here. You've been praying. You've got a heart trouble. You were just healed then. That's thus saith the Lord. You believe it with all your heart? Stand up on your feet. The woman I'm talking to there. You was praying. You've had a heart trouble fluttering around your heart and so forth. Isn't that right? Mostly when you lay down because it's a nervous condition, it did it. It's finished now. Your faith made you whole. Amen. What did you touch? You never touched me. You're 30 feet away from me. But you touched the high priest that can be touched by the feeling of your infirmities. I challenge the faith of this audience to believe that. Just believe. What do you think about that, sir? You believe you're in his presence? I see a dark shadow over you. You're dying. You got throat trouble. It's a cancer in your throat. Not only that, you need healing for that, but you need healing for your soul worse than anything else because you're a sinner. You're not a Christian. Smoking cigarettes and things, that's the worst thing you could do. That's thus saith the Lord. See, he who knew the woman's sin knows yours. Will you accept him as your personal Savior now? Raise your hand to him as you accept him as your personal Savior. May your sins be forgiven you, my brother. And oh, Satan, you have defied the doctor. You've hid from him, but you can't hide from God. We adjure thee as the church of the living God to come out of this man that he can be made well. In Jesus' name, we defy the enemy of his life because now he's become a beloved brother. Amen. As certain as I stand on the platform, you'll live. Go now and be baptized, calling on the name of the Lord, and your sins are under the blood. God bless you. Let us say praise the Lord for the whole audience that we love our blessed Savior. Blessed be his most holy name. Thou art alive, and you're the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. You are he that was dead and is alive forevermore, proving your great august beings in the presence of your saints, enjoying the praises of their lips as they offer to thee the adoration of their hearts. And we most humbly thank thee, our blessed Savior, for your presence. May this audience look and live and know that their faith in thee is not in vain, but your words have been confirmed by your presence. In Jesus' name we offer thee this praise. Amen. Just only believe. Now, Jesus has risen from the dead. How many of you here in the tabernacle tonight or the stadium that was here in the old meeting when this was not operating, but when I told you that the angel that met me said that I would even know the secret of their heart, that it would come to pass someday if I kept humble before God, them things would be done. How many remembers me prophesying and saying that? Raise your hands. That's ten years ago. Now the Bible said if there's one among you spiritual or prophet... If I be speaks and what he says comes to pass, hear him, for I'm with it. Now, I'm telling you to hear him. He is the one, Jesus Christ. I'm only telling the truth about him, and he's vindicating it's the truth. Now, we are strange to each other, my sister. I don't know you, I've never seen you, but Jesus knows you. And if he will reveal to me... What you're here for, will you accept him as your healer? I see something, you're in a room, looking at your limb, it's varicose veins, you have varicose veins. And I see you're looking at a growth, and that growth is hid from my sight. But it, no, it's on your left arm, and you're trusting God to remove it for you. That's thus saith the Lord. Will you believe? We shall pray. Let us bow our heads everywhere. Come, sister. Blessed Lord, we bring to thee this woman 
in Jesus' name and ask that you, you will heal her, O oh, our Savior and healer. Grant it, Lord. We bless her, this great church, as our sister. We ask for her healing in Christ's name. Amen. Go rejoicing, being happy, believing with all your heart. With your finger to your mouth. You're wondering about it. You believe God would heal you that scientist and you get well, be made well? If you believe it with all your heart, you can have it. Amen. Hallelujah. What do you think? With all your heart? I do not know you. Christ does know you. But you are... You are suffering... Or have been suffering. You've had a back trouble. And a lady's trouble. And you've had an operation. That's true. But that's not really what you're standing here for. Because I see your spirit doesn't seem... It seems you know that's true. There's something else that's on your heart. If that's right, raise your hand. If God will reveal it. He, Daniel said... Let it be known to thee, O king, that the God of heaven can reveal the secrets of the heart. How many knows the Bible says that? If God will reveal the secret it's on this woman's heart, how many will say that will set it forever for me? The woman I do not know. You don't know me. We're strangers to each other. But now, God of heaven, who is in Daniel's day, let it be known that thou art God tonight. I pray in Jesus' name. I see a great size, some kind of a building appearing before me, and there's a man laying in the bed, paralyzed. It's your husband, paralyzed on the left side. Your husband. You are believing for him. Take that handkerchief that you wipe the tears from your eyes with and put it on him. And don't doubt. Oh, Jesus of Nazareth. Make these things a reality to the people that they might know that thou art the risen Christ. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Mother, do you believe me to be his servant? If God will reveal to me what's your trouble, will you receive him as your healer? Then you could get over the asthma if you just believe it. Now, do you believe that you will? All right, you cough a lot, especially laying down. Oh, God of heaven, be merciful to this woman and give unto her, Lord, the healing of her body. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. All right. Come now. You want to eat your supper? Get that old usher away? I see you back away from the table. That's the reason I knew that you had usher. You're a nervous type of person. You're deep thinker, always crossing bridges before you get to them. Taking other people's things to your heart and your big plans that never happen. That's what makes you have the, uh, the condition. It's a peptic condition. Caused a spasm in the stomach. Right at the duodenum. See, it makes you belt your food up and get sour in your mouth and so forth like that. Now, if you believe with all your heart, go home and be well. Get well. Believe God. In Jesus' name, I lay my hands upon this, my brother, and ask for his healing. Amen. I go believing. Don't now. Well, do you believe that Jesus Christ can cure that back for you, make you well, take the diabetes away from you? Amen. All right, sir. Do you believe with all your heart? Amen. Then go believing it, praising God, making it real. Now that the people, somebody back there is thinking it's telepathy. Now that's wrong. Quit doing that. Here, uh, tell anyone know what is telepathy? It's taking somebody, take a number. I'm asking this woman here not to even think about what's wrong with her, but just lay your hand on mine, lady. If God will reveal to me, looking this way, what's your trouble, will you accept Jesus as your provider for what you have need of? If you will, take your hand off my arm and raise it up towards Him. Now put it back on my arm again. Just an order of contact. All right? You have a stomach trouble that bothers you. 
That's right. Raise up your hand. Now go home and eat. You're well. Jesus Christ heals you. <laughs> Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I want to tell you something. When I was looking this way, I saw you too. You had the same thing the woman had, stomach trouble. And when I said stomach trouble, a funny feeling struck you, didn't it? That's when you were healed. Walk on the platform. Say, thanks be to God. This lady's nervous. She has the lady's trouble and also a stomach trouble. That's exactly right. You believe Christ will make you well, lady? Then in Jesus Christ's name receive your healing. Amen. Have faith. All right, lady, you're sitting on the end of the seat right there praying. You have very close veins. Little lady with a purple hat on of a thing, little gray-headed lady. You had your face up like that. You're saying, Jesus, let this be my night for healing, praying to God to make you well. That's right. Raise up your hand. The lady there. All right. Go home and receive your healing. Christ makes you well. Amen. Have faith in God. Just believe him with all your heart. What if I told you Jesus heals you standing here? Would you believe me? Yes, All right, then go and be made well in Jesus Christ's name. Have faith. Christ lives. Do you believe that? You realize that that's him. He can heal that arthritis, make you well if you believe it. You believe it, he will? All right? You have other things wrong with you, ladies, and so forth, to be a woman of your age. But if you believe with all your heart and you're scared about something, see, but it's false, it isn't so. So go on now and believe and get well and be made whole in Christ's name. Amen. What do you think, lady? You believe with all your heart? Bring the little girl. Yes, sister, it was you. Little lady sitting there looking this way, kind of put her arm over her, touched her friend, then you have trouble with bowel trouble. That's right. And an arthritis condition. You believe with all your heart? The little lady next to you there also suffers with a heart trouble. No, she's got trouble with her eyes. She has bad eyes. That's right. You believe with all your heart that God will heal you? That's what you're praying for. The second row, the people there. Yes. Kind of surprised you, didn't you? That's right. But you're healed. God bless you. Lay your hands on your little friend there. She didn't get it. She's had bad eyes all her life. Lord Jesus, I pray for the woman that you'll heal her and make her well. In Jesus' name. Do you believe now, little lady, with all your heart? you believe it? What about the lady sitting next to her there looking around and enjoying it? What do you think about it, lady? You believe me to be God's prophet? You believe God could reveal to me here what's wrong with you? Would you accept it with all your heart? All right, then if you would. You got high blood pressure for one thing. So you had a thing wrapped around your arm when they pumped it up, the doctor did, and told you you had a high blood pressure. And also a steam test in your heart. You got heart trouble. That's right, raise up your hand. All right. You touched something, didn't you? If you believe, you can be made well. And if you put your hand on the lady sitting next to you, she also has got heart trouble. She's got a swelling in her body, which has caused some kidney trouble. If that's right, lady, raise up your hand. All right? Now, you can go be made well, if you believe. How many audience can believe these things to be of God? What do you think, lady? You believe with all your heart? You're very nervous. You have a run-down feeling. It's like nervous and run-down. Isn't that right? You've had an operation. And the operation did that. And the operation was uh, a cyst. That's right, isn't it? And I see a man keep standing here by. It was your husband. Well, he's healed too. You can go eat his supper now. Be well. Amen. Go on your road and rejoice. I challenge your faith in Jesus Christ's name to believe it. How many believe that he's manifesting himself right here in the building now? Now, I'm going to ask you to do something if you want to see God in his great power. 
I want each person here to lay your hand on the person next to you. Just lay your hand over on each other, anywhere you are. Just be merciful to the next person. I want every head bowed, every eye closed. And I want you to repeat this prayer after me. You pray it. I'll just say it. Oh God, creator of heavens and earth, author of everlasting life, giver of every good gift, send thy blessings upon me. As I, your penitent child, wait, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I believe that He manifests Himself in this audience now. And I now accept Him as my healer. Be merciful to me, O God. I will praise Thee. Now, just keep shut in with God. That's your prayer now. Now, just imagine this. Oh, I trust that you won't think I'm a hypocrite. God has vindicated that I'm not. But never have I saw in any first meeting this whole audience, the power of God moving over you people. Now, I am not... A hypocrite, God has revealed that to you tonight that I am not. The Lord Jesus Christ in the very vision that I'm looking at now over this audience is here to make you well. There's only one thing to keep you from being well. That's unbelief. Cast it away. I'm going to ask God to move away every fear and every doubt. Then you can be made well. Now this is my prayer for you. Oh God, I pray thee in Jesus' name. Look down upon this penitent group of people as thy servant is tired. And I look over this audience and see this faith moving among the people. You reveal the secrets of the heart. You make the blind to see. Like that little Indian boy the other night, born practically blind, fell out of his cradle at three weeks old, and was blind the rest of his life, and in one moment's time was made perfectly whole. You are the Lord Jesus. Oh, you are here tonight. And our hearts are burning within us. For you are talking to us. And we love you. And Satan is trying to hold the blessings from the people. What more could you do, Lord? You wrote the Word. You send the Spirit. You confirm your word with signs of the resurrected Christ, the Messiah, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, God, be merciful to these sick. And Satan, you spirit of evil, who has come upon the people to bind them with infirmities, you are defeated. Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is present now, defeated you at Calvary with his vicarious suffering and death. His burial and resurrection justified our faith. And we now say that you're a bluff and you cannot bluff us any longer. We call your hand. In Jesus' name, depart from here. All doubting, all superstition, and may the Holy Spirit break upon this audience and heal every person here in divine presence. Grant it, Father God, in the name of thy Son, Jesus, we ask it. Amen.